And by evolution, uh, and Carter touched on it a little bit, <clears throat> a kind of a formal definition is needed there. For me, it starts with an understanding that the universe is in a continuous process of becoming. Right? They know it's 13.7 billion years since the Big Bang. And right after the Big Bang, there was just the, the debris of hydrogen and helium. And it was as simple and as, as minimal as you could imagine. And since then, since 13.7 billion years, there's been this process. And the definition of evolution includes not just our familiar understanding of Darwinian evolution, and it's certainly that, but uh, it also involves the evolution of, of, uh, of matter, the evolution of the cosmos, of stars and planets, which exhibit these discrete stages. Like the periodic table of elements, in a way, can be understood as like a fossil record of the cosmological evolution as, uh, as there's first generation stars, second generation stars, supernovas, create a whole new level. And so the elements are, are, um, are they're evolving. And the, the standard cosmological explanation for, for the evolution of, of planets and elements is that it's a simple downhill chemical reaction. You know, that, 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 that uh, atoms and then molecules, physics and chemistry, complexify by the nature of their sort of un entropic unfolding, if you will. And I'm still no expert on cosmological evolution, but I, I, I don't think that there's any sense of, of the processes of, um, of natural selection going on. But nevertheless, somehow, the sequence of emergences keep occurring. Um, something more keeps coming from something less. You know, iron as an atom is, is far more complex than earlier forms of atoms uh, uh, that, that occur before it. And so one of the things that, that characterizes cosmological evolution, even though it's using different mechanisms from biological evolution, is that it, 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 there's, there's a sequence of emergences that build on each other, and then that the, 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 the achievements of earlier levels are taken up and used by more complex levels. You know, molecules transcend and include atoms. You know, and and uh, and, and that, that's a, an example of, of a level of complexity that that emerges and and encompasses. And so, cosmological evolution proceeds to the point where we have second generation stars with planets, and then we have another emergence. It's like a second Big Bang, right? I mean, the, although cosmological evolution is fairly well explained by physics and chemistry, the Big Bang itself is still a huge mystery, and uh, of course, there's, there's, if, you, if you take the mathematics out, um, string theory points to multiple universes. Um, but at that point, it's just mathematics. It's not, you know, it's not science. It, it's sort of theological mathematics in a way because it's highly speculative. And I mean, I don't need to sort of take up the, the multi-universe theory uh, except to say that um, you know, it does serve the theological purposes of materialism. I, I sort of leave it there for a second. The second Big Bang is the emergence of life. It's completely unexplained. I mean, the idea that you would have downhill reactions and then all of a sudden there's an emergence of a new category of evolution in which it's like a river that runs uphill. It starts complexifying in a whole new way. And, and what, what is arguably the most astonishing thing about the emergence of life is that it, uh, with life comes, in a sense, what might be termed new laws of physics. Now, physicists won't admit to that, but if you, if you think about the emergence of life, something occurs with life, which is the monumental appearance of purpose itself. Life has purpose. I mean, it's kind of a first order of purpose. Even, you know, the, the purposes of prokaryotes, right, the simplest amoebas, you know, can be reduced to, uh, uh, you know, genetic pre-programmed reactions. But even, uh, but many of the, um, of the most prominent scientists, biologists like Stuart Kaufman, talk about these most simple forms of life as uh, minimal molecular agents. That this agency can't be calculated with any computer, no matter how automatic and no matter how minimalistic. There's no neurons, right, in, in a prokaryote. But nevertheless, it'll swim up a glucose gradient. And if you put in, uh, you know, if you put in some kind of toxic uh, substance into the gradient, it'll swim away. And that exhibition of purpose can't isn't found anywhere else in physics. It's like a new law. Mm -hmm. And and this is 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 this this intentionality of life is really what separates it from matter. You know, life makes matter count. And so the emergence of, of life is, is like a second big bang because it inaugurates a second domain of evolution. 
Now, in the book, I, I try to validate as, you know, Darwinian science, you know, natural selection is a major mechanism of, of biological evolution. I try not to argue with that. Uh, but even if we give uh, all the creativity of the evolution of life, if we can assign to that creativity, you know, random mutation and environmental pruning, we still have a third big bang that isn't explained by natural selection, random mutation, and environmental pruning. And that's the emergence of what you might refer to as second order purpose. You know, that is, life has purpose, but humanity has, we have purposes for our purposes. We have a, a level of freedom in our purpose that allows us to um, not only have the purposes to survive and reproduce and maybe love our offspring like animals do, but we have the purposes to seek ever higher, newer levels of purposes. So, you know, animal needs can be satisfied relatively. But human needs can never be satisfied because as soon as one set of needs are satisfied, there's an awakening to a higher level of needs. And this continues. Uh, and this is what drives cultural evolution. You know, uh, biological evolution is driven by natural selection. And it proceeds somewhat inexorably you know, through the process of mutation. But cultural evolution is driven by actual selection. Humans are trying to improve their conditions. And if they don't try, there's no evolution, at least not at the cultural level. But culture doesn't evolve by itself. It's not inexorable like cosmological or biological evolution. Like I said, it requires that humans strive to make their world a better place. And, and even though that can be achieved by uh, discoveries or new kinds of technology and just you know, a, a, a material complexification, one of the things that I argue in my book is that uh, this, this evolution of consciousness, this evolution of culture, it, it Consciousness goes along with it, that culture and consciousness co-evolve, that, that uh, culture can only proceed so far uh, until the consciousness that is, that is uh, behind it has evolved along with it. And this sort of is, is answered to the first you know, important question is, what makes the evolution of consciousness real evolution? You know, the first skeptical response might be, cultures may evolve, but human consciousness grows more or less within the culture. Right? That is, people may grow in knowledge and wisdom and experience, but they're just growing within their individual lifetime. And just for something to count as real evolution, it's got to involve a multi-generational process. And uh, the response to that is that what makes the evolution of consciousness real evolution is that it, it is uh, proceeding al along with, with culture and that, that there's a, there's a, um, a recapitulation between the evolution of each human mind and the evolution of culture at large. This is something that within science, um, you know, there was uh, in the 19th century, uh, Ernst Haeckel, uh, Darwin, Haeckel, yeah, yeah the, the, the German uh, uh, um, proponent of Darwinism uh, in the 19th century. Uh, he coined the phrase, um, I always read this up, uh, ontogeny recapitulates philology. Phylogeny. Yeah, yeah philogeny. Anyway, way. sorry. Phylogeny. I, I should never even <laughs> try to <laughs> spit that out. But anyways, what that means is, is that, you know, he tried to illustrate it by showing that as the embryo uh, evolves in the womb, it goes through the whole tree of life, right? It starts off as a, an amoeba and it becomes a fish and then a reptile. and. And, of course, he fudged the drawings, right? And he, he pushed it too far. It always helps your science. Yeah. <laughs> and so then there was a, a period where that was refuted, right? Ontogeny doesn't, you know, the, the fetus doesn't. But then they discovered that, indeed, there is something to it. You know, and even the hardcore neo-Darwinists like Stephen Jay Gould, right, said, yes, there is, there is a, a, a parallel. And that same parallel can be seen in the evolution of consciousness and culture. That's one of the major uh, breakthroughs of developmental psychology is that there's, there's a, a loose, rough parallel between you know, humanity evolving from hunter-gatherer through tribal, through mythic, you know, rational, uh, and you can see that in the development of children. And that's how we can begin to see that, that the evolution of consciousness is real evolution, and that what even though each one of these phases, cosmological, biological, and psychosocial, are these three distinct domains, even though they use definitely different methods of development, what ties them all together and makes them all part of one universal process of becoming is that they're, they're, they're using the platforms that have been developed. In other words, we know that we're all part of evolution because we have at, our bodies are made of atoms. And then the atoms are transcended by the molecules. 
and the molecules are transcended by the biology, and the biology is transcended by the culture that lives within us. You know, our entire human history is what gives us the current consciousness we have today. You know, it's living through us. And and so because evolution has purpose within it, because purpose is one of the key things that are part of you know, life may evolve inexorably through random mutations and environmental selection. But, but Darwin's theory of natural selection presupposes intentionality. Intentionality of the, I mean, it, it, unless animals were striving to survive and reproduce and fill up every niche, there wouldn't be any competition for natural selection to act upon. You know, this intentionality isn't just some epiphenomenal thing on the side. It's actually the foundation of, of evolution of life and certainly the evolution of consciousness. So when I talk about evolution's purpose, I'm not talking about it you know, intelligent design or some externally controlled purpose. I'm talking about the purpose that emerges within us. And when we come to understand that this purpose that's been coursing through this unfolding sequence of emergences for the last 13 billion years, that we can feel it within us, we begin to understand that our purposes are its purposes. That, uh, that, that um, you know, that, that, our, that our natural evolutionary impulse to make the world a better place and to, uh, to live up to our potential, and to be compassionate, to be a good person, to strive for the beautiful, the true, and the good. This is, to be human is to know what it feels like to be evolution happening. And so that's how we can kind of look within us and begin to understand that this cosmic process is revealing itself within our own minds. So that's enough. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>